Welcome back, everybody, to Cougar Culture. I'm your host, Dorian Alert. And, of course, I am joined by my good friend, broadcaster, Jis Sokolsky. What's going on, man? That's it, man. Only a broadcaster from here on in. That's it. No more. Not not a scholar. No, nothing. I'm a, I'm a one-dimensional, one-trick pony. I'm doing all right, Dorian. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing pretty well. I'll, I'll do better on the intro next time. Okay, I got you. I know. I, I expect more out of you. It's just <laughs> it fell a little flat today. <laughs> let, 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 let's give you a proper introduction. I'm joined by my good friend, broadcaster extraordinaire, a scholar. He he does <laughs> just about everything, and of course, his dedication to Kane Athletics is unmatched. I'm joined by Jis Sikolsky. Much better. Appreciate that. Thank you so much for having me on yet again, Dorian. Also a gentleman and a scholar on the call with me. Not on the call, on the podcast. But uh, yeah, we got a p- pretty busy uh, week ahead. We have a fun episode in store. So uh, might as well just jump right into it with this After the Whistle segment. And we're going to start off with basketball from both men, the men's and women's team. Both of them went 2-0 and in this previous week against Ramapo and NJCU. The men beat Ramapo by a score of 76-71 to after that game was postponed today. Went up to Mawa and got the job done on the road. They were bolstered by, uh, excuse me, they were bolstered by 16 Latrell West points along with 14 points from J.D. Daniels, and that is behind their leading scorer, Pat Strizala, who had 18. And then against NJCU, a nail-biter of a game, I must say, filled with a bunch of technical fouls. It was a very weird stop-and-go kind of game to watch, but at the end of the day, we had Latrell West emerging as the leading scorer with 22 points, but you really can't overlook Nate Lyle's performance in that game. Seven rebounds, 17 points. Two assists. He had a dunk earlier, uh, early in the game where he kind of hung onto the rim a little bit too long. Also, getting the start was Jeff Nolan. He had a great impact defensively. He had to guard the six foot ten Ben Todd, uh, offensive force to be reckoned with. So the men were able to kind of mitigate their slow start to 2022 with two great wins in the end jack as we kind of wind on the season. As for the women, who also went two and zero. Oh, against Ramapo and NGCU. They got their first win in Ramapo again, uh, completing the season sweep. Brittany Graff went off in that game, shooting nine for 17 from the field, 21 points for her. The entire game she played, 40 minutes for Brittany Graff. Uh, She went two for six from the three-point line, and she followed that performance up well in a blowout over NJCU with 17 points of her own. That was good for second on the team behind Shannon McCoy, of course, who scored 24 points, moving her up to fifth all-time in the Canes' leading scoreboard. Regardless, 10-point lead now for the Cougars. Here comes Shannon McCoy with it, guarded by Wooten. Man, this is definitely the lowest the lead has been since the first quarter. Over to Molesky, trying to create some space inside for Shadi Badir. Puts up the turnaround jump shot off the glass. And that has her teammates all fired up. What a technical play there from Badir. Yeah, it was a beautiful move, sensing the overcommitment from the defense. As Rodriguez delivers a beautiful play. That was a lot to say. <laughs> yeah, like, like you said, Jish, the... The first game against Ramapo for the men's, they were down at the half 37 to 28, but they ended up winning the second half 48 to 34. And that's how they came out with the victory. Like you said, Pastor Zala had a great game. Ethan Stith, a freshman that we've seen mm-hmm. play more and more, he came in, provided six points, two of two from three. So he's mm-hmm. been playing absolutely amazing. And like you said, he's a bucket. Absolutely. And <laughs> And when we head over to the game against NJCU, like you said, there were a lot of technical fouls called. Um, <laughs> we, we saw a coach get ejected. It, that is true. There, there was a lot going on, but it was an absolute nail biter of a game. 
Jalen Jameson it, it, had 11 uh-huh. points for himself too. I'm, I really got to say it shouldn't have been a nail biter. Kane was up pretty big uh, with just a few minutes to go. Then a lot of mental errors took place. A lot of untimely turnovers, missed free throws at the end of the game. They still were somehow able to close it out due to some impeccable defense, but offensively, they almost flushed that game away. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we'll, we'll have the opportunity to hear you and our, one of our other partners, Kevin Meehan, on the call as well. Midcourt there as that will be Darley no good from the corner and Jalen Jamison skying up to get the rebound. Nate Lyles is open down there and throws it down with two hands. And I and then and also for the woman, like you said, uh, in that first game against Rampo, Shannon McCoy, of course, came in and provided 15 points. Kayla Anderson had a double double herself. She had 10 points and 12 rebounds. And, you know, we, we saw Macy Seaman come in. She she only had three points, but again, she's been absolutely electric as she is a starter at the moment. And speaking of Macy Seaman, she had an incredible game against NJCU, 14 yep. points, six rebounds. She went seven of 12 from the field. Brittany Graff came in 17 and Shannon McCoy almost had a double, double 24. She had 24 points. She almost had a triple double. She almost had a triple double. That's right. I, we, we saw <laughs> she, seven assists. Oh yeah, eleven team. She was dishing it, get given a lot of those assists inside for Macy Seaman. Kayla right. Anderson almost had a double double again with nine points and eight rebounds. So, the, right. I mean, I, I just got to add, like they kept finding Macy Seaman wide open. This NJCU squad, they have a lot of big names, a lot of great talent, a lot of transfer talent but Macy Seaman was just able to find herself open under the basket consistently and able to finish with ease two blocks for her as well. So she was a two way player that night. Absolutely. So on the woman's side, Kane still has possession of that first place spot going 12 and two within the conference. Rowan sits right behind them in second place at 11 and three Montclair state is in third. William Patterson in fourth Remy Poe in fifth Stockton six. NJCU seven, TCNJ sits in the eighth spot, and Rutgers Newark and Rutgers Camden are both nine and ten. Mm-hmm. On the men's side, Stockton currently sits in the number one spot, followed by Rutgers Newark. Rowan is in third. Montclair State is in fourth. Kane has actually moved up to the fifth spot. Mm-hmm. William Patterson now sits at six. NJCU seven, TCNJ eight, Ramapo nine, and Rutgers Camden is in last place, but Kane is moving up. There, there's a lot still to happen within the, within the conference with several more games to go. Right. And you know, Kane was named as the dark horse favorite to win this division. Uh, not the favorite, but the dark horse to win the end Jack. So look out for a strong end of season from them. They've seen these teams already now. And now to talk a little bit of men's volleyball, we had a lot of winning this week. Men's volleyball also went two and O this week in their matches. They went three. They won three sets to one in a win against Widener University, and they also went. They completed the sweep against John Jay. That happened this past Thursday, February third. That was a relatively quick game, I might add. Yeah, definitely one of those in and out volleyball games. They can either take two hours or like forty five minutes. I was closer to a forty five minute one. I was on the call for that one. Uh, Duncan Belkey in both games had tremendous games. He had um, 18 kills, a career high against Widener and against John Jay. A little anecdote. He was he has such a strong right arm. When he spiked that ball, it hit the same libero about three times in the game. You know, whoever that libero is out there, you know, you're a trooper, man. I don't know how you're able to sustain all those hits, but it bounced off his head a few times. And Duncan Belkey is been such a force for this Kane team. Logan Ramos will be taking this serve again. Three serving one. John Jay has their biggest lead of the night. Ramos sends that one off the top of the net. Laughing at some of the distractions Kane is putting up for him. As Belke sends that one right into the earth. Off of the foot this time of Bryce Glasper. And I mean... Absolutely. Kane came in and dominated. I don't think they were... Or Kane, Kane was never down for a long period of time. The, the difference in points most of the time was one when they did get down and afterwards they, they either led the whole way or they completely blew them out. And now speaking on to women's swimming, 
we had Tegan Powell once again. She won NJAC Rookie of the Week. She she's been doing doing great things. Just this is her third NJAC Rookie of the Week award. Yeah, it's been back to back years for this swimming program with really impressive freshmen. Now both of them on the squad. Last year, Brianna Shaw was the talk of the town. Now Tegan Powell adding to her vict- her uh, award mantle. I would not be surprised if Tegan Powell won Rookie of the Year, and she would deserve it. Absolutely. Like you said, Jish, we have a packed show for you all. We're going to start with a review of the esports season this past fall, and that will start now. Thank you for sticking with us, ladies and gentlemen. We are now joined by the head coach of Kane's esports team, Matthew Chopik. How are you? Doing well, doing well. Thanks for having me. Of course. We're going to jump right into the questions. This was Kane's first season with an esports team. How did you feel from the coaching perspective that the first season went? I mean, it was our first season, so there's a lot to learn, you know, with starting a brand new program, especially, you know, a collegiate program. There's a lot uh, of moving parts. There's a lot of uh, things that need to be done in order to for it to be successful. But for our first semester, I think it went pretty smoothly. Uh, We collaborated with our existing Kane Esports Club, which I think give a, a big shout out for, you know, helping just get and populate and, you know, be able to manage you know, the pilot uh, semester of the program. Um, But all in all, you know, being able to fill out the teams and just show what we got so far with the uh, current amount of students that we have for the program, uh, we put out a pretty good uh, performance all around and it was a great start of the program to begin. Absolutely. You had several playoff teams, including the Valorant team and Madden went all the way to the championship. So I would say that's a pretty good start to the program. Yeah, all, yeah, I, I'm definitely proud of our Madden player because uh, he just tried really hard. He, you know, just like all of our teams, they put a lot of effort in. They wanted to put their best uh, foot forward in, you know, in the you know, collegiate league and into the playoffs. And just seeing us be able to take at least second place for our first, you know, semester of the program is definitely a great accolade. So, so from your perspective, how is coaching esports different from any other kind of coaching? And, you know, what similarities can you say there are? Um, Well, I would say esports is a lot more unique um, in several ways. First of all, you know, all the competition is being done on the Internet. You know, with traditional sports, you know, everyone's there physically in person, whether it's soccer, basketball, football, whatever it may be. Um, Everyone also practices, you know, in person on a field or wherever it may be. With esports, it's a lot more unique in the fact that, also, you know, in certain scenarios, especially like during the pandemic uh, before, you know, in-person resumed in fall of uh, 2021, you know, our players are able to still play remotely with their computers because that's the benefit of playing through the internet. Um, additionally, any sort of practices are done on the video game itself all through software. So it's definitely something different compared to traditional sports. You know, there's obviously similarities in terms of how you operate things, but there's also a lot more moving parts, like I said before where not only you have to worry about, um, like as a head coach, for example, with the program, there's not just one team. I have to, you know, oversee several teams. We have between eight to 10 teams that are competing overall in the program, you know, from games like Valorant, Overwatch, um, Super Smash, all the sport games like NBA, Madden, FIFA, Fortnite. You know, there's just so many different, you know, uh, teams that we have to manage and just to make sure everything is running smoothly and everyone's, you know, once again, performing as best as they can. So there's a lot more to it, but, you know, being in the position, I'm definitely privileged. It's like a dream job to me because I've always wanted to be a part of something esports related. I feel like I've already had the experience from so many years back, uh, just growing, uh, especially even through uh, uh, college and graduating from Kane as the class of uh, 2021. So all, all in all though, um, the coaching is great and, you know, I'm still continuously learning and, you know, seeing what else we could add to the program to make it succeed for not only the school, but for our players. Given the success that you had in this past fall semester, how do you see the spring semester going? Because I know with regular sports, you can't just go in and say, we're going to repeat what we did. But especially when it comes to esports, there are so many different moving parts. Yeah, so our main goal for uh, the spring semester with the program is to definitely find our players more uh, uh, opportunity 
to compete in whether it's other collegiate leagues or other external tournaments just to get not only their names out there in the esports you know landscape but also for the school um and once again there's still so much to learn because it's still uh, the esports industry is still very young and it's developing and so is our program so we don't expect to you know bolster in terms of our roster right away within just one academic year but it's more it's more for us to continue uh continuously build on what we did last semester and then into this semester and then also for fall 2022 to be even bigger and better from then on but for the most part our main focus is to just continue uh finding more opportunities for our um students to compete in other leagues and also find you know ways to also um invest in the financial matter like sponsorships or um any sort of uh you know collaboration with other schools even my final question goes into the ECAC the way that they have games so we competed you mentioned some of the games earlier in Smash Bros Madden FIFA 2K Valorant Overwatch Fortnite and several others Will there be any new games added this semester? So the only game that is uh, going to be potentially added this semester will be Call of Duty Vanguard. Um, I've been talking to some of the uh, students who have interest in Call of Duty and adding them in. Um, I don't know exactly if they're going to be in an ECAC capacity because it comes down to the ECAC if they're going to, you know, actually like host um, Call of Duty. If not, we might do some sort of uh, like uh, – you know, other league or have the club handle it by a chance. So we definitely want to funnel them in some capacity. So that's the only game that I think it would be added in. But other than that, everything's going to, uh, you know, all the other games that we've had last semester are also going to be competed uh, for the spring. Interestingly enough, this week was National Girls and Women in Sports Day. So we have a very special treat for you all this week for Cougar Quick Hits. We have members of Kane's women's basketball team. No, 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 not just the women's basketball team, the first place women's basketball team. You're right, Jish. I, I don't I don't know. So it's just slipping my mind today. It's disrespectful today. We are now joined by the women's basketball team, head coach Mandy King and four of her seniors, Sarah Olivero, Kayla Anderson, Shannon McCoy, and Anaya Moore. How are you all doing this afternoon? We're doing great. Thank you so much for having us. <laughs> of course, of course. Of course. We're going to jump right into the questions and we're going to start with you, coach. You've seen this group grow together over their four years. You know, what can you say about their growth, not only as players, teammates, but also as individuals? Uh, this has just been an incredible group of young women to coach, and I'm so blessed to have them as a part of our Kane women's basketball family. And, um, you know, it's, it's amazing. These girls, um, you know, they, they just understand the sacrifices that need to be made to win in a league like this. Um, they understand how um, tough and disciplined and together that you need to be to win on this level. And, um, you know, and they just, they really play the game with just a, a joy and, um, you know, everybody wants to be part of something bigger than themselves and watching these guys grow up. It's just, um, again, such a blessing to be a part of, of, of this group. And we're so fortunate to have them represent Kane university and our women's basketball program. And, um, you know, they've done everything for us both in the classroom and on the court. And we've got one, la one thing left to accomplish and that's win the NJAC regular season championship and, and win the NJAC tournament. So um, I'm so excited to see this group go out and get it done. Next question is for Anaya. Um, after not playing in the short 2020 season, how did it feel to get back onto the court with your teammates? Oh, my God. It was really overwhelming at first because I thought I was going to be so behind, but it was kind of an easy transition. And it just like when I come, came back, it reminded me how much I missed the team and the culture that our coach built. And it was fun. It was great. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed playing with these girls. And yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, this next one is for Kayla. Um, throughout your years at Kane, you've really carved out a, a more, a bigger role in this team. Now you're a starter and your numbers have really shown that. Uh, what kind of focus goes into your game in the, during the off season that really motivates you to get better? 
Well, for me, um, basketball is just an all year round sport for me. Like I'm always playing, whether that's pick up outside or just in the gym working on my craft. And like Sarah said, all the hard work is really paying off and it's showing on the court. Not only for Kayla, though, for everyone that's on this Zoom right now, all of you are statistically having some of your best seasons. Kayla, you're 80% from the free throw line. Shannon, this is the most points that you've averaged so far at 16.6. Sarah, 8.5. And Anaya, you have 2.9, but you also have 23 total blocks on the season. What can Ooh, you say? Okay, <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, what can you say about, or what can any of you say about how you've come together this season, but, you know, what can you say about, you know, seeing those numbers and the way you have been playing together? I think it really just goes all back to, like, how we were freshman year and, like, throughout sophomore year and how much work we've been putting in and how we get closer and everything and all those extra reps. They're, like, really all coming together. And especially the COVID season when we didn't have Anaya, like, you know, like, as at that time we were like the lonely three juniors and like we miss Anaya <laughs> so like we come back this year and it's like full circle and we're all back like it's you know freshman year again but this time like we're all playing together on the court like we all imagined and it's just like we're playing for each other and like we just want to win kind of thing yeah these past four years have gone by so fast so I think in these past four years like there's just a trust between the four of like past seniors that like we built so much of just because like we watched year after year, like not getting an end jack or not being the team that people like expected to be where or we coming, were. Or coming so close to getting it. Yeah, like it just being in our reach within every year, I think this is really the group that's like decided that like enough is enough. Like I trust Anaya with my life on defense. Like I trust Shannon with the ball. I trust Kayla with the ball. Like we all just have a trust in each other that I don't think has ever been there before. I agree with everything that Shannon and Sarah said. I feel like we all built, like we've been here since freshman year and like we've all grown on the court together. And I feel like the trust that we have in each, like each other is really showing this season. And we're pretty close to winning this end, Jack. So I think we're doing, we're on a good road right now. <laughs> My next question is going to be for Sarah. This is a very different team from when you all started. Like we've said a couple of times already, you, you've had players come in and out, obviously graduate. Some some people don't return, but now you have a lot of younger players that are behind all of you. So what do you tell some of those younger players that are trying to find their way onto the team and going throughout the ups and downs of a season? I try to be as realistic about it as possible. Like nothing's easy. Like it's certainly not an easy transition from high school basketball to college basketball as a freshman or just finding your way as a sophomore and junior. I know for me, like it took a while for me to find my place on the team, but like we have belief in them. Like we see the potential that they have every day in practice, every time they step on the court in a game. And I think some of them are really going to find their way here and they're doing a really great job, but I just try to support them every day and keep them doing what they should be doing. Like Allie, like I want her to keep shooting the ball, keep driving, like trying to just push them each day to make them better and better. Yeah. And kind of, kind of related to that. This one is for coach. You know, it's no secret that four out of the five typical starters on a night on a nightly basis are seniors. I'm not quite sure about the eligibility um, situations with all of you, but um, coach, how confident are you in some of these underclassmen that that will eventually step up and take the mantle when they graduate? Well, I think that the most important thing is that they've learned from the best. Um, the these four players um have given their whole entire hearts to our program and um you know and it's and they've played just about every role um in our program and um you know so these guys have taught all of our values they've taught you know just how how we do things around here so that's the best part is that we have they have the best leadership you know and um you know and then for the underclassmen again i think just being able to play alongside, you know, Kayla and Shannon and Sarah and Anaya, like it, it gives them confidence that when it's their turn, they're going to be able to do the same things that these guys are doing. So, um, you know, I guess, I guess I, my confidence comes from they've, they've learned from the best leaders that we've ever had. And um, when it's their turn, I know they're going to be ready because, um, you know, once again, they've been around, you know, girls that have are the best teammates, um, the best leaders and some of the best players that Jack's ever seen. <laughs> Absolutely. And Anaya, you know, one of those young players is Macy, who is one of the other centers on this team. 
and both of you as a tandem are incredible. Like we said, 23 blocks for the season for you. Macy always goes up and gets a lot of big boards, especially late in games. You know, what can you say about the way that she started to shine as a young player? Oh, my gosh. I'm on Macy every single day at practice because she's just an- <laughs> And as, a, like, a freshman coming in playing all these minutes that she's playing, she handles it so well and effortlessly. And I feel like over these next couple of years, like, yes, I took her under my wing, but I feel like this year alone, like, she's learned so much already and she's confident enough to step on the court and do what she needs to do. So I have... I'm just excited to see her play these next couple of years. I know she's going to do amazing and I'm just going to keep going hard at her on practice because we make each other better, but yeah, she's good. She's good. She's good. (laughs) Awesome. And this next question um, goes for Kayla. I mean, this season has been pretty, well, it started off on the wrong foot, let's say, but it really has improved as the season has gone on Uh, with less than a month left. Um, what are your thoughts on this currently first placed NJAC team? Well, they start off on a um, bad foot, but those games were put there to um, prepare us for the NJAC. And like, if you think about it in the preseason polls, we were ranked number five and now we're number one. So like, everybody could say whatever they want to say, but we put in <laughs> our hard work and we're number one right now and we're going to win the NJAC. <laughs> <laughs> I like the confidence. I like it. No. I'm so proud of these guys because this was the hardest schedule that I've ever put together for any team in the last 19 <laughs> years. <laughs> you know, and so and it, it was put there because we have the experience to understand that those games are are here because we have goals of winning the NJAC and going to the NCAA tournament and winning games there. So in order to do that, we had to play tough competition early so that we know what it looks like so that we can practice like that. We can play at a pace like that. And, you know, these, I mean, the only way you can do it is when you have leadership that understands, like if, when we do fail, you know, which it was designed for us to fail, (laughs) let's be clear, um, you know, that we have the leadership to absorb that failure and be resilient and to bring out the best in us. And then, you, you know, the, you know, we get into NJAC play and we beat Montclair right away. And it was the, but these guys had to sell that proof that, okay, we're going to have these hard games and it's going to pay off when we get in the NJAC, you know? So, um, and the thing about this group, like they're so their vision for this season is coming true. You know, they, you never back your way into a great accomplishment and they believe that we will win the end Jack, but they're also humble enough to understand that this league is really, really tough and they get back in and nobody works harder than, than them on a daily basis. So like the vision is really confident, but they work like, you know, we work like we're trying to climb in the end Jack every day. So it's, it's really beautiful to watch because these guys just really understand what it takes to be successful. And um, they're getting it done on a daily basis and nobody works harder than us. Shannon, you've been climbing up the all-time scorers list this season, and you're currently in eighth place in that category. How does it feel to know that your name is forever going to be etched in the Kane history books? Forever. Yeah, <laughs> honestly, that's like definitely like a huge honor, and it's really cool. And, you know, as like a player, everyone has their personal goals, and, you know, sometimes they don't voice that, and I'm definitely one of those people. And growing up, I have very athletic family, very competitive background if anyone knows my brother my sister my parents anyone like everything's always a competition so I definitely always had that competitive mindset to win want to be the best and everything and you know uh like being able to come play at a collegiate level and Mm -hmm. leave my mark as a player that's something that's a huge honor and you know like I've yeah I've always wanted to do that I always wanted to leave my mark you know and I couldn't have done it with any of my past teammates, current teammates, my coaches. And it just goes that even though it's my name written on that wall history book, whatever it is, like (laughs) every teammate that played with me has a part of that because without them, I would have been nowhere near where I am now and could possibly be in the future. Coming on this episode, we're also going to have one of your former teammates pace, you know, what can, yeah right awesome she she's gonna be she's gonna be talking about her um coaching career and a little and a little bit about her playing days what can you say about the type of teammate that pace was and also you know her her current coaching career because she's being pretty successful and coach you can answer too I'll go first (laughs) honestly I'm so proud of pace like she really worked really hard and you know as a teammate she's definitely someone who's hard on you 
uh, in practice, she's not fun to guard. Mm. And I think <laughs> be the first person to admit, like, Almost, like Hayes was very hard to guard. <laughs> and I know Sarah could speak for that 100%. But uh, all her hard work, her dedication, her mindset and drive to want to do something, like, she will literally... I think a cruise ship could get in the way and she'll figure out a way to like yeah. move it. Like I <laughs> genuinely like she what's if she wants something, she's going to go get it. And like anything that she put her mind to, she's gotten. And I literally am just so proud of her. And like as a past teammate and roommate, like I honestly look up to her, even though she's annoying to guard in practice and <laughs> she would yell at us. But honestly, like she did that to benefit us. And yeah, I love her. Yeah, I have to say like I... And I'm also like really proud of Paige just to see her successfully do every like accomplish everything she's ever wanted or strived for is really just so respectable. And as a team, like, yeah, it wasn't my favorite person at guard. <laughs> it wasn't the best of things. But like again, like I wouldn't be like I wouldn't play the way I play now if it would if it didn't start that like that first day I had met Pace in practice and I walked out with a black eye. like really like she really has set the tone for like the level of competitiveness and like where we should be striving to be in our playing as a person so it's really just like I just have so much respect for her and I look up to her as a person and a player and I'm just really happy to see that she's being so like successful in her life and in coaching career and just overall in basketball she gets to continue to do what she loves I would would say um, Pace's will is undeniable. You know, I think the growth from her freshman year to becoming the player of the year in the end, Jack, her senior year was just, it was unbelievable to watch that process. Um, And I think it just goes to show again, if that, that character um, truly drives winning and it drives success and it drives culture and um, her, her character is, Um, you know, she's someone that's going to be successful her whole life because of the strength of her character. Um, And, you know, she's, she's just a winner. Like these guys have said there, nothing is going to get in Pace's way. Um, And, and she's a very loyal person, you know? Um, And I think, you know, when you have love like that and discipline and loyalty, um, you know, those create all the best, you know, things in this life and Pace, you know, exemplifies all of them. It took all the words out of my mouth. I admire Pace so much from my freshman year. She's like, she was a great role model for me. Um, Her mindset is insane. Like she's just a great person all around. And she's everything that they said, like they took the words out of my mouth. Like, she's just great. I love her. <laughs> Pace was just like, if it was one word to describe Pace, it was like a bucket. Like <laughs> you just give her the ball and she's going to go get a bucket. Like no matter what, she's going to run through five people and still score. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like she, that's just the person she is. And like, she's going to go hard for every play. And even currently now as a coach, I know she's doing the best that she can. And now a very special treat for you all. I've said that a couple times already, but this one is a very special one. This week on Beyond the Competition, we have a former Kane women's basketball player and the current interim head coach at DeUville College, Pace Lang. So now it's time to go Beyond the Competition with Pace Lang. <laughs> Our next guest is a very special one. She is a 1,000 point scorer and currently sits at 13th all time in the Kane all time women's basketball scoring history. She is an all NJAC first team player, all ECAC first team player. She was a Division three hoop, D3 hoops.com All American and the 2019 to 2020. And Jack Player of the Year, and currently the interim head coach at Duyuville College. I'm pleased to introduce Pace Lang. How are you, Pace? Good. I'm very happy to be here. So thank you. Absolutely. So we'll hop right into the questions. We're going to start kind of how it ended. You know, after your playing career in 2020, luckily the team was able to finish out the season, but that's when the pandemic started. But you did go on to graduate that year. What was that whole experience like? Well, it definitely was challenging in the fact that, you know, it hit during mid-senior mid year, so I wasn't able to have a graduation ceremony on and, and kind of normally like everyone else usually does. But, you know, the Kane uh, handled it very well. They did provide um, summer commencement at the end. 
But for me, I was more just, you know, trying to stay on the ball with um, applying for to be a graduate assistant because that coaching is something I always wanted to do. Um, so I tried to stay on top of that. And luckily I was blessed with this opportunity at first to be a, the graduate assistant for DUVO. Um, so I snatched that opportunity right away. And the first year there um, was the one of the best opportunities, obviously, that I've had. Um, and the staff was very welcoming um, and everything like that. So it was challenging in the most part of just, you know, my senior year being a little different ending, but, you know, having the support of my team and Kane making it still special, um, we got past it, so. So you already mentioned that you went on to be the graduate assistant in your first year at DUville. Um, you know, what, what did it mean for you personally to still be around a sport that you love so much? Uh, it meant a lot to me. Um, obviously, like even my teammates could contest to this. I'm a very competitive person. Um, I take basketball very seriously. I'm very passionate about basketball. So that's why I knew coaching was the thing for me, because um, especially even just being a part of like a sports environment, um, campus environment, um, because I'm very passionate about it. So one thing I always wanted to do in life was instill that passion that I have into the other generations below me. Um, because, you know, at, at times it's bigger than basketball as well. It's about the connections you make on the team um, and all part of the process along the way. And that's something I always try to share with my team right now is that, you know, it's bigger than basketball. The connections you make, they last a lifetime. Um, the memories you make, they last a lifetime. The four years fly by. So becoming a coach, um, I'm very grateful for it. I love it. Um, I have a great team, um, high energy. They love the sport uh, just as much as I do. So overall, it's just a great experience and I'm truly blessed to have it, this opportunity, especially at my age and um, the point of life I am at right now. Funny enough with your interview with, or with the interview that we had with the, some of your former teammates, they all said the exact same thing. You're very passionate, but they said that you were not their favorite person to guard in practice. Can you speak a little bit about what they were like as teammates as well? Yeah. So, like I said, I'm a very competitive person. I practice. I always try to make my teammates better. So I'm coming at you on, especially on offense, because that was my game. Um, I'm an attacker. I always was as a player, not never a shooter. Well, I did shoot it, but you know what I mean? I was more like, let me get in the paint. So... For me, I always just try to make my teammates better. And again, that's what I try to make my teammates competitive at practice. Like it's nothing personal, but you know, you're my teammate. I'm trying to make you better. I'm going to come straight at you head on. Um, and that's what keeps the energy going. And that's what pushes your teammates and not only pushes your teammate, but it pushes you to get better every day. Um, and that's what a true te teammate should do. Um, my teammates, um, like I said, since I am a very intense person with basketball, I'm very competitive. Always try to be a good teammate on top of that. They understood me as a player. So it, like I said, it was nothing ever personal. Um, they knew I was just trying to push them. And, you know, my teammates always too, like always reminded me that, you know, it's okay like to laugh too, have fun before the game. Like Shannon McCoy and I always used to do like da da pregame dance parties in the locker room. So we always still have fun with it, but they understood me as teammates, um, as a teammate. So we never, it never got like to the point where it was bad intentions or anything like that and they knew we were trying to push them I was trying to push them and they pushed me right back so it was a good environment so going into your first season as a graduate assistant what was that whole experience like making the transition from being a player and now you're on the sidelines uh it's definitely a transition uh, one of the funniest things I always say is like the hardest part about coaching is sometimes you just want to like do it yourself. You just want to put yourself out there and be like, I got it. Um, but it's definitely a transition. I mean, um, it's a different perspective, but like I said, um, all the things that I learned throughout my playing career, all the training I did, the extra work I did on the side, I just try to instill, instill that in my team and show them that, you know, you're not going to, without hard work and putting in the extra work and being all into the process, being all in during the 40 minutes of the game, being all into the two hours of practice that we have a day, um, even the lifts that we have, um, you truly won't be as successful if you're not going to be all in. Um, so I guess the transition is just the fact that instead of me doing it myself now, I'm just trying to show them through my experiences that this is how you could be successful um, and just showing them that, you know, I believe in them and to push them every day. Um, just like I try to push myself and my teammates when I was a player. In October, 2021, you were named the interim head coach speaking of opportunity, you know, was that a shock to you and how did your role change 
from being just a graduate assistant to now you're in the head coaching position? Um, I mean, it's definitely a transition, obviously, because as a graduate assistant, you're not the head coach. Um, so now, you know, I'm making all the calls and everything like that, working with my assistant um, with all that. But I mean, on top of it, too, I'm still trying to complete my master's um, and hopefully stay on the right path. I'm going to complete it um, in May, uh, this May. So I'm very excited about that. So but, you know, I did that as a student athlete, you know, being in school, playing the sport. So it's, you know, kind of the same thing with just um, planning. And, you know, my agenda is my life. So I always use that. But I guess the transition is just the fact that, you know, I, you're taking care of, you know, the 13 players on your roster, you making scouting reports and everything like that. But when the opportunity came to me, obviously, um, I was a little shocked, but I was grateful. Like I was ready to jump on the opportunity. This is something I love doing. This is what I want to do in life. Um, so I was excited. I was hyped. Um, I was ready to tackle the challenge. Um, and my team, you know, jumped right in with me. So it was a smooth transition. Um, I was ready. I used, I had all my knowledge that I learned throughout my playing career. Um, and then I just kind of defined my coaching philosophy, which one of my big ones is that there's always four things always in your control. And this is something I tell my team every day. There's four things always in your control. It's your urgency, your purpose, your energy, and your effort. Those things are always in your control. So if you're lacking one of those, that's when I'm going to get hard on you. But you know, if we, if you don't lack any of them, opportunity will follow. So those are four things, like I always say, that are always in the control and the, what I expect from them every single day. Um, so, you know, it's, transition was smooth. My players jumped right in with me. So I'm very grateful for this opportunity. I love doing it. It's a blast. Um, and I'm enjoying every second of it. So since you're still pursuing your master's and congratulations on going on to finish this upcoming May, uh, what is your day-to-day kind of like, because you, you mentioned your agenda is your life. So what is your day-to-day as both a student and as a head coach? Uh, I mean, it can get busy at times just with the, the homework pile, but um, I just, you know, it's all part of just planning and making sure that you're budgeting your time correctly. Um, one of the things that always stuck with me is make sure, you know, don't mistake time for achievement. So if you're just spending a lot of time on something, doesn't mean you're actually achieving something. So that's one thing that stuck with me that I pay attention to. So basically, I just make sure I have everything set for the day, basketball wise, practice wise, have my practice plan ready. Um, I got film um, set up. Um, I got the scanning report set up and everything like that. Once I do that, if I got extra time before practice, I'll do homework. Otherwise, um, I'll get ready for practice. After practice, that's when I'll grind out the homework. Um, and then every day I just, you know, set up what assignments in order that I have to get done. Um, so I just try to stay very organized um, so I don't procrastinate at all. Um, but I always, I was always a firm believer too, that when you play a sport too, that, um, and then now that I'm coaching it, you know, it, do, it keeps you more on track to get things done because you have a set schedule. Um, so, and then, you know, you just got to make sacrifices sometimes. Sometimes I got to do work on the bus when we travel because we're in the East Coast Conference. So we're traveling from like New York City from here, which is like six hours, seven hours, Bridgeport, Washington, D.C. So I just use the time that I have um, to get work done. Um, if it's basketball work, school work, whatever it is, um, I just try, I just get it done. A little bit more about you as a coach. How would you, how would you describe yourself as a coach? And then how would your team describe yourself as well? So it's funny because I actually had one of my, two of my former players, um, well, actually four, uh, it was Nat, um, Maleski, Morgan Dietz, um, Cindy Foresta, and uh, Dana Scalfani. They actually came to one of my games and they all said like, your coaching style is not what I expected it to be because like different from when I was as a player, because like I said, as a player, I was intense. I'm trying to push my teammates and, and, you know, that's why they said I was hard to guard because I'm like, I don't, I'm coming at you. Like I'm trying to get better. I'm trying to make you better. And I'm very passionate about it. I'm keeping that same passion as a coach, but I also, I'm, I feel like, you know, what you learn as a coach is how I might talk to you. You might respond differently than the next player. So, you know, I try to stay calm and, you know, when I'm giving constructive criticism, be constructive with it because they need to hear you. If you're yelling at them, you're being all hectic. They're not really hearing you. Um, so they just said like my coaching style was a lot more relaxed than I thought, than they thought it would be. Um, but I think like I learned through a player too, like, you know, as a coach players, you don't want the player to get all wild up. You got it. They're looking at you to keep them calm um, and keep them composed. Um, so um, as a coach, I would just say like, I'm not big on 
one thing I learned as a player too, like if you're making a mistake and you get ripped out of the game, it, it doesn't help you. So one thing I, you know, am as a coach, I'm not going to, you know, scold you for making a mistake, but it's how you respond to that mistake that I'm looking at. So if you turn over the ball, are you jogging back or you're sprinting back? Are you the first one back? So that's how I'm going to respond. How you respond is how I'm going to respond. So that's one thing I'm big on. And like I said, the fourth thing is always in your control and just being all into winning the details and wanting it more the whole 40 minutes during that game. And like I always say, if you're not going to be a good teammate, you're not going to be on my floor Um, because, you know, culture is a big part of the game. And I know, you know, having a good culture where I played at Kane um, and even in before Kane, like my AAU program with Team Miller and stuff like that, culture plays a big part of it. You know, how you play is how, how you practice and how you uh, mold with your team is how you're going to play on the court. So I'm big on culture as well. Um, so that's just kind of me as a coach, but it's just funny because all the, like all four of my players that saw me play, coach was like, wow, like you're way different than I thought you were going to be. They thought I was going to be up and down yelling, screaming and being all hyper, but I was opposite. Um, just because I know they like, as a coach, they look up to you that you need to keep them composed. So you got to stay composed. Um, but so don't get me wrong. I get hyped too. We make an M1. I'm hyped because um, energy is a big part of it as well. And, you know, it comes energy from the top player all the way to the bottom. It's important. So it was just a funny moment. But You mentioned some some of those players. Um, and so now I do want to talk a little bit about your career at Kane. You know, how would you describe your time at Kane as a student athlete? Uh, it was one of the best experiences of my life. I would not... Uh, if I had a chance to do it all over again, a hundred percent without question, I would do it. Um, I loved playing at Kane. Um, I love, especially my senior year with Matt at AD and, you know, Jay being so supportive. Um, they made my senior year unforgettable. Um, and then my, all my four years, um, I loved my team, like the coaching staff. It was just a great experience. Um, I felt like as a play, as an athlete, student athlete, I was able to excel both on the court and off the court. There's a bunch of opportunities at Kane. Um, and everyone there is just so supportive and the athletic department, everyone's involved. You know, I would be walking the hallway and just be like, oh, like I saw your game last night, like how to go. And I feel like that's a big thing about a university that you need is, you know, as an athletic department, you all need to be supporting each other and lifting each board up, um, which I felt at Kane. Um, and even this, like my professors would be like, oh, good game. I'm coming to the game tonight. So um, overall, I had a fantastic experience. I came, I would do it again in a heartbeat. I'm still very close with my my team um, and my and the coaching staff there. So overall, it was a great experience. And like I said, for the third time now, I would do it over again and I miss it every day. And if I had to give like advice to people, I would just say enjoy every second of it because the four years flies by, flies by. So when I was a senior, I was like, I felt like I was a freshman yesterday. So that would just be my advice is just enjoy every second of it and make the most of it. Now it's time to preview the week ahead and Jish will start things off with basketball. Yeah, not a lot to report in the basketball front this week. We uh, only are previewing until Tuesday, and in that span, each team only has one game. That'll be at home against TCNJ. Uh, I believe when Dorian mentioned the standings earlier, they are below us in both uh, categories, in both men's and women's basketball. So, you know, you never want to count an egg before it hatches, but hopefully Kane can uh, keep their winning streaks alive. Uh, with these games that are coming up on February 5th, this Saturday. You're not going to want to miss it. Hey, like any given game, any given game. Exactly. Any given Sunday, Saturday, whatever, any given day. Absolutely. So women swimming, they are swimming against the College of Staten Island in Staten Island on February 4th. And they are also swimming against the College, the college of New Jersey on February 5th. That will be at home. That is actually senior day for Katie Pelleggi. So congratulations to Katie on a wonderful career at Kane. Moving on to men's. But hold on, hold on, hold on. We're not going to see the last of Katie Pelleggi because she's also on the women's lacrosse team. So uh, when we eventually interview them, you might still see her face. So watch out for women's lacrosse. That's going to be starting soon. Absolutely. That, that'll be a fun one. Well, that preview will be in a couple of weeks, actually. So you don't want to miss that episode. 
coming up for men's volleyball, they have a try match in Quincy, Massachusetts on February 5th. They will be playing Emerson College, and later on mm-hmm. in the day, they will be playing Eastern Nazarene College. Mm. Hey, a fun fact about Emerson, that's one of two colleges that has accepted me so far, so I might be at that school next year. We'll see. Of course, I'm still rooting for Kane, though. Come on. <laughs> Anytime Kane is going to come to town, whatever sport it is, I don't think Emerson and Kane play each other too often in any sports. It's always going to be Kane till I die. Come on now. I don't care where I am. <laughs> love the Cougars, man. We love it. We love it. <laughs> volleyball also has one more match within this time span on Tuesday, February 8th. They will be playing against Ramapo, and that will be at home in Harwood Arena. You don't want to miss any of the sports happening this week. Mm, mm, mm. I had a great episode, man. I'm excited to hear you on the call coming up within within these next couple of games. It'll be uh-huh. fun. Yeah, this will be fun. All right. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, you know, leave a thumbs up if you're on YouTube. Uh, just give us a hey if you ever see us. You know, we're friendly. We don't bite. And uh, <laughs> see you around. Yeah. All right. We'll see you all next time.